Indeed you can, and here we are. If you're listening to this, um, it means that you've found the headphones. So, um, online publis publishers, that could be pretty much anybody, but um, Philip Banzer, our presenter, has um, selected five people who have published something since the last Republica that um, really uh, made his jaw drop. And who these people are, he's going to present to you now. Applause. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for the introduction. Nice to see you all here this late evening. Yeah, I'm Philip Banzer. We had this format at one or two other Republicas. We tried it, and somebody came to me and said, well, it was great, something like Markus Lanz for the blogosphere, <laughs> which is nice. It's a German talk show. And I said, OK, we did a break for a year, <laughs> totally not related to that. And no, um, it's a nice format. and. As it was said before, the format is, well, I looked at what kind of people um, I, I saw since last Republica. I wanted to talk to 10 minutes plus minus a few questions of a few um, more famous people, not as famous people, and this sort of little mix th thematically as well, the format is I get my guests on the stage, and we'll sit here first uh, with two, then three, then four. We're we'll talking like 10 minutes with each other. And then you have like the opportunity to answer questions yourself. And then there, in the end, there's a large uh, round for questions. And then there's the end. So uh, to make it short, the first guest is Patricia Camarata. Um, the author of dasnuf.de, a, a mother blog, mummy blog. So Patricia, come on stage. Hi. <laughs> Look at this, you have your own microphone, how nice. I'll sit down here in the middle. Sit down beneath me. Want the water? No, thank you. Too nervous. I'm going to have to burp otherwise. Some applause for Patricia, please. And now there's water. So the que reason uh, we have to say today, blog turns 12. That's that's correct. Yes, on the day 12 years ago. Congratulations. Um, you. In the last year, you made a book we have here. Let's show it to the camera, Zack, which is called, of course, man, you ass bomb. And it's the best off of 60 articles posts from your blog. Can you say that? Yeah, it's, um, I picked the best 60 articles from my blog, and they found their way into the book. 12 years, your blog, uh, in poverty. Now it's getting hard. Not really. No, it's, it just grows on the you know, goes grows along the way. I never really had a goal. It just you know was a side project that's going to um, continue. Well, the people who don't know it, um, you, I'll have to present you a bit. You have uh, three children. You have a, a patchwork child with the other two, and blogging for 12 years. To, with family topics, and you said you would embrace the mummy block predicate. How did it come to that? Well, it's what other people have said about my blog. I don't really know when that uh, came about. I started my blog simply as a digestive organ. So things that um, you know happened to me and that uh, concern me, I simply blog about them. And at some point, this 
child topic um, came came along. I never thought that was really my main topic, but um, especially since it since that book got published, I um, heard the label Mummy Blog more and more. It was a bit difficult at first because I thought this was the typical kind of um, reductory statement. You know, n never mind what kind of competences you have. Otherwise, as soon as you become mum, everybody, everything um, gets reduced to that. But I think th these are very important top topics that I can uh, talk about on my blog. And I noticed this from um, the click count that people like to read about this and from the reactions and the comments. And I decided to take it up with a bit more self-confidence. So yes, now I have become a mummy blog, so be it. Uh, one story illustrating a bit how you're writing, what kind of topics you write about, which I found nice was the story you talked about in the last post about Mama Leaks. Uh, maybe talk about that a bit. What what kind of phenomena this is? Mama Leaks. Mummy Leaks is an article I wrote as part of the uh, net political debate because. It found its equivalent in the in um, private life as soon as children understand to speak and to um, to to listen, and as soon as you learn that it's not about secrets that um, get out, because it's some which can also be uncomfortable because I don't want to um, want everybody to know what I what I say to my partner and um, you know in case my children hear overhear it. And it gets gets ripped out of context if it, if my children hear it. It is a very makes for a very funny story, but it's uncomfortable in the context of family, as well as um, the context of um, surveillance, because it it's an example of how data gets interpreted in the wrong way. Uh, every time I took a shower. In the morning, a neighbor came over who ordered um, lots of lots of parcels, and I had the feeling that he actually stood in the um, stood outside my door waiting for the waters to start running, and he, he rang the bell to um, uh, to get his uh, parcels, and um, my kid. Recount this story to my uh, to my partner, and said that um, uh, uh, um, a man rings the doorbell each time his mum gets naked, and um, then she tells him to shut up and to go to the go to his room. So yeah, each time each time my uh, my mum <laughs> undresses and um, somebody rings the doorbell, I have to go to my room and I'm not allowed to speak. What I find so nice about your blog and the book and the whole topic is, A, it's totally important part of our society, mothers, fathers, family, and um, it's described and celebrated like strangely in all this traditional media, you don't see it anywhere else, but uh, with you and uh, some others, you, there are not of anecdotes and put into the um, societal context. You have little examples which you always put into societal topics. There's the birth, um, uh, helpers, um, insurances. Why do you think this topic uh, which is a million people, um, why is this not really represented or uh, lively, shown lively in traditional media? I don't know. <coughs> I mean, these are often topics that are a bit difficult to talk about, um, where, you know, even you're, as a mom or dad, you, you have a hard time speaking about it because you can't talk about it openly. And I, you know, some people, need help talking about it, and that makes it less attractive. Um, and, 
you can, yeah, you can write about it in established women's magazines, but that's a bit uncomfortable. And I, I like to read other other parents' blogs because I prefer to see, um, you know, people's realities rather than these advertisers' realities. Wrote for 12 years now, which is a lot. 10 years of public car, you're for that for 12 years. I thought maybe we could uh, do a little review of 10 years of family topics in the societal dimension. Uh, what did change in the last 10 years? Um. That's a very good question. I see a sort of distinction between what's in books and magazines and newspaper that all looks very similar to me you can you can look at a parents magazine from five years ago and it, the contents are still the same as they are today I see more changes online many a lot more is shared these days a lot um, a lot more honestly and there aren't that many um, prejudices um, rather you're honest and say, yeah, we, we all have to get up at, uh, at 20 past 6 in the morning and nobody of us really likes that. And that's uh, different from what I find in literature and um, traditional print media. Uh, like, like I said, how did the, the image of family change? Is, did the acceptance for unconventional forms of living grow? Okay. I, sadly, I don't believe that either. I think you have a sort of filter bubble. Of course, you know, as a parent blogger, you <coughs> you see a lot of, you know, you look at a lot of families, like um, uh, p families with gay parents and um, families uh, with children with di disability. But as soon as I leave Berlin, I no longer really see that diversity. Instead, I, I rather see some stigmatization, and it's not really talked about it as openly. And now you blog about your family. Um, what do you do with your privacy and the privacy of your children? What's your policy? Well, I never blog um, things exactly as they happened at the kitchen table. Instead, I find to um, find the, the overarching topic and um, to find things that other families may be able to relate to. So I try to uh, to build up that uh, that arch, and of course there are always events that um, you know that spark the stories. But I um, I exaggerate them or I reduce them to a more uh, common level. You didn't always block under your your real name as Patricia Camarata, which I do for three or four years. Many women that think about um, posting in the net with her their own name. I, th I think they're a bit sh shying away because of what happens to other women th with examples that are pretty uncomfortable about women who, who get a lot of hate. What's what's your experience? I'd knock on wood if there were any. I, I've, I, I've noticed hardly anything in that regard. I mean, I can count the examples on one hand, and apart from those five nasty comments, I've only had nice feedback, and um, this encouraged me to publish things under my uh, under my real name and to um, publish a book because it's a uh, it's a very fluffy community that surrounds me, and I'm very grateful for that. What I also ask is, what I want to ask as well, you have a societal political. Um, um, perspective and what really annoys you in politics and families of diverse forms to make it easier for them? Uh, things like tax models and uh, indirectly about working world. Well, there are loads of small things you could um, you could do with uh, very s uh, to to reap a large benefit, and I think there's still a lot left to do, and it's, it happens very slowly. And this um, sorry, this zero hour is kind of a nightmare of parents. But yeah, like you, you've talked about it, you've mentioned uh, midwives, insurance benefits, and lack of uh, staff in education, lack of um, 
examples in schools and in kindergarten, this entire evolution of family um, can be brought up again. There's so much left to do. It's a bit sad that it's all happening so slowly and sometimes we're even taking steps back as in um, single parent families where uh, benefits are reduced. You're an advisor, IT advisor. You're working a lot. You're making ads on your website. Are you okay with that? Or do you think you could expand your business, uh, put another focus? I'm, I'm very happy with it because I have a very nice employer who lets me do almost anything that I, I like to do. And um, this, you know, blogging is my hobby, and I'm, I'm allowed to be very free. Each time I get um, request for collaboration, I can I can pick the ones I like and I I would use myself. And this means that I'm not subject to any pressure to um, accept any deals that make me think, yeah, I don't really want to do that, but the money's good. I think it's very hard. It's very tough if you want to make a living out of blogging, and that makes me very happy that I can be an IT uh, project leader. There are questions. Uh, raise your hands. There are microphones in the hall. I don't know if someone for the, from the team is responsible for that. Are there questions? Or else I would just ask at the end. Um, thank you a lot. Uh, Sid, and thank you. Um, I mentioned it um, at the very beginning because that I am, uh, have my own podcast. I've had it for 10 years, and I've ha I have a very big heart for alternative media productions, and th that's why we're having this format as well. That's why Patricia is here. And last year, there was a very ambitious and very nice project um, that saw the light of the Internet. It's called 4000 Hertz. It's a podcast label that uh, tries to... Um, tries to advance this uh, genre of independent media production that I very like, very much like, and the co-founder of it is Nicolas Seemann. Please come up to the stage now. Hey. Just uh, sit down there, take a microphone. Would you like a glass of water? I think that was an opener. Something. Test. Test. <laughs> so, 4,000 hertz, 4,000 hertz. You make a quality podcast, that's what I read about you. <laughs> Not everybody took that up so kindly, did they? It's nice to say this at the beginning. Yeah, let's talk about the elephant in the room. You know, in our first press release, it was stated is that we just took it and yeah we just titled it that way so which I, I guess I should explain what it is start yeah so say you tell what what is it the last one just started the first portfolio was six so what is it that um, that you concern yourselves with we don't have really have a, s a program, a schedule, classical interview format, storytelling, buzzword, but whatever. We want to do th things that are produced, so with music and sounds, a lot, bit, a bit more opul opulent, because we think that could help the German podcast culture if we do this a bit more. There are a lot of examples in the USA who do these things, and there was a lot of hay hype in the last year, and we want to um, start with that and do it in a German way. So give an example of some topics that you, uh, that you use in podcasts. My colleague Christian Grasse does the system error, which does failure culture with uh, technical uh, culture and other stuff, which is the most ambitious storytelling thing we have, where we work for one month at one um, 
uh, session and it's half an hour, it's great produced. It existed before, there was an episode before we started with 4000 Hertz and it's an example for so really ambitious stories we want. There have been many attempts, well, podcasts have existed for 10 years now and um, there are loads of projects in that area but ever since um, uh, you could see that, that it became a viable business model in the United States and ever ever since um, it became obvious what kind of for formats became possible if the money existed, um, there have been more attempts to, um, to finance uh, podcasts and if your colleague works on, a, on an episode for one month it becomes very obvious that you need to finance it somehow. So you took uh, one approach at financing your podcast in Germany. Can you can you explain how your podcast label finances itself? Well, our goal is to have the sponsoring model in the U which works in the U.S. and we want to take this. It's a bit harder to to explain in the U.S. US there is this break where they say this episode is sponsored by and so on, and this isn't really happening in German productions, but yeah, that's what we try and to finance ourselves with that. We are thinking about other ways. There are, well, we see with communication with the, with the companies there, it's a bit hard. Why? Because the media is not really known and they, there's doubt this is for the masses. Podcasts don't have such a great image, which have different reasons, because people think it's for the niche, it's just lab labbering into the microphone, and this is not really what we're doing, and we have to explain that as we try to make another thing uh, to, to have this contact with customers, so it, it's something special. So, so which of you listens to podcasts on a regular basis? About half, all right. And which of you listens mainly to German podcasts? And which of you listens mostly to English language podcasts? So the Germans have the majority. So you've been doing this for a few months and you have sponsors, for example, Audible. Spotify is one of them as well? Or are you only listed there? Oh no, you're just listed. And um, do you get money for that? There's this NDA, which, which is what you have to, um, to sign. So would you do it again? Would you list yourself, uh, list your podcast again at uh, for like with Spotify? Yeah, I should. Uh, I, I I haven't yet uh, come to to uh, be sad about it, uh, but I think it's attractive now because we want some people listening to us and there is this platform of course it couldn't be exclusive from the beginning and we said that that worked and I can't say much more than that and do you feel like you're getting uh, reaching significant numbers of listeners through Spotify it's far too early we, we have three weeks we, we don't have any numbers so we can't really say that but I think it's interesting, they called it shows at first, you can follow it instead of ab ab have a abonnement, a subscription, and this, this is uh, a bit hard in Germany, and if it's in the free section of Spotify, it's very nice because there is more um, attention on blog podcasts. Uh, um, and but you've been doing this for a bit longer with Audible. What was their feedback li like after a few weeks? <laughs> well, for all parties, it's something new, and they said we we try it. Made a nice um, offer. Audible is interested in having their own things exclusively on their platform. Okay. Yeah, it's a bit hard. And what was uh, the listener feedback like? Because one argument against advertising is that German culture doesn't accept it. Um, German listeners don't accept it. They get annoyed. What was it like? Well, I'm really positive. Nobody really um, had bad reviews, which is in part because we don't have any adverts or something. We just 
speak into it, and there is a clear separation with the content, and the people don't think this, this goes on their nerves. And it is okay because you know from our media that they have to finance themselves. When if they have to w want to do it as a job, and people know it really doesn't work another way, and we have to get money if we want to do this as a job. And you, um, uh, you're publishing your podcast on a platform on SoundCloud, and this uh, led to some some debates because German podcasting culture so far has been reluctant to um, use third-party platforms and has preferred to host everything themselves. Well, now you're on SoundCloud. What um, what made you choose to publish on a, such a large, pl large platform? Well, platform to go into this discussion, I think it's more pragmatic reasons, which are I did pro podcasts before. I have Podlove, which, which is a, pod, a, a plugin for podcasting. I got some nice t statistics of listeners. The problem is if you put it on your own server, and the customer, the sponsors, look at this back end, they say, where they can numbers independently from us, and this is one reason why we do this. On the other hand, it's much uh, more, uh, much less, imp much cheaper. We we pay not a much, uh, not much uh, to upload as much as we want, get statistics and. So you've been saving up to do this full time. What is your vision of the uh, of podcasting? Where, where, yeah. Well, our goal is let's just do it for one year without any um, reservations. Lower this and made, make more podcasts. And if this works, we are happy, and we don't have to give it up. But let's, let's see the the stocks are enough for the moment. So people are used to paying for podcasts in the United States. Where <coughs> you're producing radio at the moment, or you're producing podcasts at the moment, and they're quite. Um, quite sophisticated they're actually sophisticated enough to um, resemble traditional radio where do you see um, yourselves in you know where do you see wh why is it good that you exist I understand the question the way that you think there's something additional to radio well so far traditional podcast formats um, they you know, you don't have to like them. They sit around and talk for four hours. You don't have to like it, but um, at least it was very distinct from traditional radio. Um, like um, things that are as complex as your system failure that are beautifully presented and researched, they, they resemble traditional radio a lot more. Yeah, sure. Structurally, of course, from the contents, it's because we don't really have an agenda from the media houses, we can look at the content, the form, the length, like we want. We can change it at a whim. Um, you can't really do it if you work with the radio. And that's wonderful because our creative potential, I would say, you can we can just live it like we want and just put it. So it's after content or not any formalier, not this has to be this and this length or the you have to find uh, focus. And looking at the podcasting scene in general in Germany, do you feel like it's only uh, things are only starting to happen now, or is there stagnation? What's your feeling about it? Well, I was a bit uh, angry at the start of the year because the chances are not really used to, to just produce audio and to put it in the net that, that people don't do this. And I think that's still happening. I, dis I I really like this blubbering podcast, as I would call them. And but I was a bit tired, and I wanted to 
do something else and now people should do something else, be a bit more ambitious and not just look at money. I don't think it's stagnating. I think the environment is really um, coming along right quite well. The, the technology is interesting and I think other people are doing similar things to us as the feedback we got. And I think there's uh, yeah, broad topics. And I think it's great that you're trying this um, and that you're trying to uh, use the sponsored approach uh, dis uh, in spite of all the all the um, conflict that this may cause. Thank you very much, Nikola Zema from 4000 Hertz. Do you have any questions? If and you know, if there are so many podcast listeners here, do you have any questions to Nikolas Zema? Yes, there's somebody all the way at the back. Somebody's waving. They'd like to have a microphone to um, ask their question. Could somebody get a microphone? Yes. Hello. Hello. I um, only wanted to ask about the image of podcasts. So how, for instance, you approach Audible, do you, do you say, hello, I'm here, create podcasts, or do you say, um, I make radio? How open are companies towards the podcast label? Well, you have to do a lot of uh, talking. The medium is not that known yet. We have to say what we do, not just it's radio or something. If Audible, of course, they know what podcasts are. But we're doing it with companies who we think will understand it and know about it. But of course, you have to tell the media. We were talking to the press a lot. We have to explain it to them. And it's not as easy to do this. But yeah, it's, 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 it's possible. Uh, no further questions. I would like to um, thank Nicholas again for um, all this information. <coughs> as uncomfortable as it were sometimes, or may have been to you sometimes. But my next guest is a woman who has uh, talked ab about a subject that's very dear to my heart and um, that I feel has gained a lot of importance since last Republica, and it's um, the subject of hate, uh, both online and on the street. And I'm very happy to have found somebody, uh, Ingrid Brudnik, where is she? Please come up to the stage now. Hey, hello. Hi, nice, nice to see you here. Sit down, please take this microphone, want a water? Okay. Later. Profil, a news magazine in Austria. You published a book named Hate in the Net. And as I said, I think this uh, topic won a lot of um, yeah, attention in the last year. And you put down some nice lines, wrote them down. And uh, it's, it's, it has been there all the time and not just last year. Do you think hate, hatred um, rose in, in the context of the refugee uh, movement in the last year? Do you think there's a new quality of hatred? Yes, completely. Uh, for one thing, it's quite interesting each time there's a topic that polarizes the political debate that these are phases of increased commentary online. That's nothing new. But um, I assume many people agree that um, the, the refugee debate was a topic that um, caused huge, um, huge gaps in some countries. You can see that on Facebook. You can see that in newspapers. And this. Um, this hate, this um, is is seen online as well, and something that's that's very new are the stories of you know are, are lies. Then that's not existed before. You think the internet, especially Facebook, 
there is, are, is hatred that is more visible or that hatred gets empowered and on the streets and in physical violence? I think the answer is somewhere in between. Why are people often, often a bit, you know, more rough online? Why are discussions so so quick to derail? One of them is online um, uh, is the lowering of thresholds online. One of them is the fact that you're invisible online. For instance, if I were to insult the person in the in the front row here, I. I'd still be able to see that um, I'd, I'd gone too far. I'd see that the man who sits there would look at me very shocked and, um, yeah, it would be very uncomfortable for me to to have been too, too rough. But online, that doesn't happen. I don't have to face the consequences of um, of insulting people because there, are no, there is no non-verbal feedback. And to answer your question, the problem is that People have probably always been aggressive, and each of us is unfriendly at times, but we've learned to hold it back because otherwise you get sanctioned. And uh, the, what's new is that um, people are now uh, are now um, gathering to um, in, in echo chambers and you know rallying against minorities. Uh, we talked about echo chambers a lot and. The Rodneys, the, the scientists, tried to describe in which topics of society are accepted or which aren't. And they tried to uh, to note down that before internet, when there were few media which told people what to, to say and what not, uh, there was this window, there, there was the constant in the middle, and in the left and the right, this was yeah barely, barely OK. And this echo chambers at Facebook that led to discussions outside of this border this and where, where people are, are uh, accepting each other and tr um, meeting each other and having the most extreme uh, opinions and where they get um, praise from others like that, op approval. And these, these oh yeah. We're outside of the co uh, dialogue of consent, consensual dialogue. What do you think happens to a society where th this has enough space? I think it's an interesting question. Um, um, how much does how much does society have the uh, the opportunity to devolve? Um, one of, one example is feminism online because there. Are you know, we've reached certain milestones. Um, there are things that are no longer being said. But there have been uh, setbacks as well, because suddenly topics are getting too visible and debates are getting too visible. And what we're seeing here now is not, it's not always representative what happens online. The internet is um, trying to, um, uh, to skew the debate and Many people call themselves the silent majority because they're neither silent nor a majority, but you, you're very quick to get the impression that they are. Um, if you read certain sites, it, y you get the impression that many people agree that, um, you know, uh, immigrants should, uh, refugees should be met with violence. And I, in a book, I read a lot of um, hateful comments, and it's very uncomfortable at times to read these. And you um, get you get worried about the state of the world. And um, uh, then I coincidentally found a study that asked people if they would support. Um, laws against hate speech, against um, hate speech towards mon minorities. And in, U uh, in the United States, it's very few people, but in Europe, it's two thirds. In, in all the country countries that um, were studied, Germany is um, where people support these, um, these laws the most. And there's a threat that this minorities that's very vocal might um, set, the, set the, the agenda. To this image, 
the if it's what Karin Emke told in another, in another talk, the hatred doesn't just happen. Uh, hatred has a structure, and with the structure, there's a society that has uh, other groups that are weak and uh, without security, and they are the object of the hatred when hatred is there. And I think this fits with this because there are people there outside of the consent and I asked myself what, what can we do, people who are sitting here, we, um, to break down these structures that make hatred happen? I think that the individual can do quite a lot actually. I assume that most people who are here have a profile on Facebook and especially in heated political debates you find yourself uh, in a heated political debate with your friends and family very quickly and as soon as people are as you as you um, as you notice hate speech it's very important not to react with more hate speech because of course the the first impulse is to fight back but that um, plays into like that um, supports the people who who um, proliferate the, themselves with that and it's very difficult to do this and you can start um, you can you have to you know cool down the debate a bit and the champions league of, of this is humor because if you can reply in a humorous way despite people um, despite hate speech then that's the best way to calm down other people. Um, the German Welt newspaper does this quite a lot on Facebook and um, a user wrote something about Donald Trump and said it's very obvious that the media are, you know, are building up Donald Trump and now, I mean, they're writing nasty things about him now, but then once he is president, they're gonna, gonna suck up to him. Um, and uh, you know, they asked him to predict the tomorrow's lotto, uh, lottery numbers, and he, uh, the user himself found it quite funny and actually replied with, you know, prediction of the next day's lottery numbers, and this calmed down the debate. And if you, y you have to give people an, an invitation to get back towards the center of the debate. But the question is, if, if you're t t talking about Trump, where read an interesting article about this phenomenon where the thesis was that Trump, Trump is personification of a societal uh, group that doesn't, uh, doesn't look at it as uh, a normal thing that there are groups of people that have needs and look at that these other groups could be right, but there's this 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 um, ability to joke about it that this may not be there anymore. So what can you do with the humor with this? Well, the question is if we can bring back Donald Trump towards the center of society. I don't really have an answer to that. But uh, I have another session tomorrow, and I'm going where well, I'm going to um, talk more about the psychology of this. But there are two things you can do. Um, even Donald Trump has made some statements that he couldn't make in Germany or Austria because that would have legal consequences. And if you know, if there are, yeah, you're allowed to fight back. And. You can. There's another approach. You can talk to people about different values. They, you simply cannot reach them on certain subjects. But if we take up different subjects, um, we may be able to reach them. And there's an example of this in the um, refugee debate when you s the, when you s saw the pictures of um, the dead boy at um, uh, who got washed up on the beach. And uh, you, people were starting to uh, to calm down a bit, and this is a, an example of a different value being spoken about, because there's our societies don't uh, permit violence towards children, and if you remind people of these values, if we can all agree agree on that, can be a workaround. 
Thank you, Ingrid Brodnick. Hustle Nets, Hatred in the Net is your book. Any questions, comments? Which, well, I don't really see some, might be the light, but thanks for your time. The next guest is the category nice that somebody does this. I'm, my job is being a journalist at the uh, public radio and I'm with uh, the press conference of the government and I always wish for someone who mixed up this um, this, this present um, media stuff with the government and stuff, and which is via follow this project of Tilo Jung. So come to the stage, please. So, magst du auch was? Habe ich irgendwo den Flaschenöffner? There's the bottle opener. Would you like a glass of water? Thirsty. Yeah, this is not carbonated either. This is a classic in uh, the public service broadcast. Because uh, after, after, uh, before you, sh <laughs> they serve you water with a lot of, um, lot of bubbles in it, so you burp nicely. Your project, Na Young and Naive, is has been going on for quite a while now, but um, there's. Essentially, you started your project of annoying the people at the Federal Press Conference last year. For those in the audience who don't know it, what is the Federal Press Conference? It's not an institution of the government, which many people think. It's a committee of journalists in Berlin. Um, they are taking in journalists in Berlin and let them go again, and they decide who gets to be there and who not. And some of them... Uh, and they are inviting the federal government for a conference. So that's when you see these members of the government on the uh, in front of the blue background. These are members of the government who are invited to the conference. Yeah, the speakers are there uh, three times a week, which is traditional. They are there voluntary, and the politicians come every one two weeks. But it's something else every time. I've talked about some uh, members of that conference about you. I've talked to some members of the conference about you. Uh, what they think about this Tilo Jung who sits there. Um, and the feedback has been mixed. Uh, yeah, used to that, yeah. Some of them were quite annoyed and said, yeah, he's abusing that forum and he's got no idea and he wants to do interviews. Um, even though it's not meant for that, it's meant for asking one or two questions. But there's also been feedback along the lines of, yeah, that guy's really annoying, but it's nice, you know, media changes, it's, it's good, uh, something's happening. And there's always, uh, there's also been a prob problem-oriented debate in that, um, in that organization with its members and you. Yeah, there was this um, big conference between all the, the people who are in there but I can't really talk about it publicly. I would love to blog about it because it was a great situation, because everybody was against me. But and you can uh, tell what, what they'd have said. Yeah, you can imagine the kind of um, the kind of accusations. But the format is that you um, uh, you you know you have your camera and then you ask questions. How do you choose your questions? Well, the goal is to document over a long uh, range. Um, how the government is talking and, and making arguments, and this is it. I just look at what comes with the day, uh, a lot of open questions with the most mainstream stuff, and I can think about what the, the other people will, will tell, and I uh, pick my questions accordingly. I don't really put down the other um, capital uh, journalists. I just want to add an, an, an additional media, so there is another view on the, the press, the politics. Uh, but why? What, what are the things that um, people who work for established media don't ask in that conference? Well, I think most journalists are sitting there and they want a briefing. The, when is the chancellor driving to Greece? When is she coming there? With whom is she talking? Yeah, OK. And this is not that interesting, because I don't drive with, with her. I, 
uh, can't. And I want the basic questions. And the other people who are asking on a ba daily politics basis, because they know it and want to write about it in their columns, I just want to talk about the, the, with the federal government about the basic question. And what are the kind of things you learned in that conference? What was your biggest moment? Yeah, there are some every day. I was really surprised that the, the Ministry of Interior didn't, wasn't able to give a clear answer. Uh, I don't know. I'm with them for t two years, and we're fil filming for one year. I need one year to understand this language and the language and the uh, techniques of answering and uh, get used to them. What do those techniques look like? I, I did all of them. I, I didn't say all of this. Didn't you listen to me? So all these protocol of yesterday, they were all in there. And I did, don't have to add anything. Yeah, you're laughing, but it's 80% of all the answers. But I think, yeah, we know why it's shit. And I say, no, you have to document it over years so the people after us can look at it and say, what the fuck did you do with your government? I assume that you've met up with Mr. Zyber, the uh, Chancellor's press speaker? Yeah, well, he got me onto the, the idea, at least. At episode uh, 63 of Young, Young and Eve interview, he tells me why he's informing me and why he is the speaker. and. There's this conference, and yeah, there's how we inform the the public, and says, yeah, well, just come with. And then I just registered myself, became a member, and now it's too late, I guess. And but after he realized what he got himself into, uh, did you meet up with him again? Uh, let's say we didn't have contact for half a year now. Uh, he he just ended the relationship. He broke up. And, the, uh, and what's the feedback like? Yeah, with all other ministries, I'm pretty okay. Just not with Mr. Seibert. Um, he takes a person. So you have quite a large number of views on YouTube and on Facebook and. Um, I mean, you, even though you know that Facebook counts three seconds as one view, and that's how you finance yourself through donations. Yeah, the, we we are selling parts of it to Extra Three, and and so this whole satirical shows on TV. We are not completely dependent on on donations, but yeah, ninety percent of everything is through you. So thanks. How many of, the, of you are there? The Facebook thing, the community site. I have a cameraman, uh, Stefan from Sch von Schulz in Frankfurt, who is with with me. Now, these kinds of formats that call themselves alternative, well, that, that um, you know, try to establish themselves, apart, you know, beyond the mainstream. Here we are. We're going to start annoying people. In my experience. They um, draw them, you know, they attract some people that you don't really want in your living room. How do you, um, uh, how do you deal with these people who see us, you as a part of a big revolution and who prove that, you know, all the conspiracy, conspiracy theories are correct? Well, many don't understand what we want to do. We are critical of our government, but they are confusing this with uh, uh, radical um, disappointment with the system, and yeah, they want to abolish uh, the <laughs> BRD. <laughs> and yeah, these whole strange guys, they are there, and we are pulling them with us. Sure, but we have actually every thing, every kind of fan betwi between the left and the AfD, the right and right most populists, and. I don't know it's not if there's controversy uh, um, topics they they get controversy in the uh, 
comments as well, but that's a Facebook problem. I've, um, I'd like to ask you some questions as well that you may be a bit uncomfortable. Republica, and I, I love this, is, um, has finally reached around 50% uh, female speakers. It took me quite a while to um, reach a conclusion that it's a bit odd if I interviewed 10 people and all of them are men. Now, you were part of Crowd Reporter, a freelance journalist project, and you saw yourself confronted with the question of why there are so few women. And you said, um, as a simple lack of German genius, would you say that again these days? I don't know, but I was the guy who put, got the other guys uh, to think about there are not enough women. I, I don't know who misunderstood this. I just shared this this thing where I said this is this is bad in the uh, staff. And after that, a few bloggers turned it around and said, "Yeah, the the Tilo Jung he is proud of having so less uh, so less women." But in your you know in what I've just quoted, it doesn't look like you're you you're criticizing it. It's more like a reason of why it's so few. Yeah, the reason was um, from, yeah, we want to have quality journalists and quality bloggers. And well, after these blog posts, a lot of people uh, came forth. When Sebastian came, said, yeah, uh, come to us. But the right people didn't come forth. So I didn't do the interviews. Others did. Um, why did it fail, in your opinion, or would you like to add something, Patricia? Well, said person was me who blogged about it. <laughs> you, you didn't correct it, but you wrote me, I think you should delete it or write another way, and you did some suggestions. I did edit it a bit with Essa said you can see it in the blog because I said there, there has been added something yeah this this preface of the crowd reporter when February as, as I saw it there was a workshop where this came out as a defi deficit but nothing got changed People saw it, wrote a bit about it. A whole lot of female journalists um, came forth in different topics where there are mysteriously no female journalists who brought quality and was just put down, yeah, it, it, it is that way and we are looking at what we can do. And I don't think it was your com uh, comments um, thread. where you can put it down to the leadership of the project. That's not the first time you personally got some attention with this topic. Uh, yeah, talk about it. You can, we can fight about it now. I don't really want to fight and really have some examples. I personally said, saw that are in opposition to my feminist views, but I'm solving this very easily in online. It's very easy to just block people and then they don't exist anymore. And uh, I think that's nice with that. Thanks, and I think I solved it that way. What a nice end. What a nice ending. We're just going to block each other. But yeah. It's very helpful. Sometimes it's very helpful. All right. Any more questions? Uh, any more suggestions or remarks? Oh, there, there is one, two. We have 10 seconds left. Any microphones? Oh, there are two, maybe. Oh, somebody is fetching one. Very good.
Danke. Ich würde einfach an dieser Stelle schon mal an Frau Boning Frau Boning, Brutnik, uh, look at uh, how we can put this uh, situation together with comedy again. Yeah, it's not hatred. I think we have to say that. And just have different views. Resolve this. May I? Yeah, I, I was afraid of this. I was afraid of this at this very moment. I have to see that uh, there's a more, you know, debates are a bit tougher in Germany than they are in, um, in Austria. And these things are talked about, if at all, um, after, you know, after a few white wines in Austria. Um, people often ask me if I have a humorous comment um, and I... Um, I fail each and every time. It's very embarrassing, and I, I don't have very much to add, I'm afraid. There's another question. Hi, I'm Amy. I have a question at Tilo. What's the goal of your blog? Because every time I look at it, it's funny and it's sweet. But we are in the times of AfD and MPD, and I living in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, and that's a lot of bullshit. And I'm afraid. And isn't this just helping the right-wing parties and people uh, miss hope in our government? Our goal is to show how the um, government informs and all the people. I complain that we are showing how stupidly the government is um, is informing. If, if that's playing into the hands of uh, of right wing populists, the people can't really make. You know, I don't think that's very fair. If we because all we're showing is the way it is, and I understand that many people take this to, you know, take this um, uh, to as a foundation of you know their their refusal to um, to understand the democratic process but other people choose to vote for the opposition and um, I, I don't feel responsible for building up you know the support for right-wing populists or building up uh, distrust in politics in just in general uh, if anything we're building up distrust in the government that's a good thing we uh, müssen Schluss machen Okay, we have to close now. Thanks all of you for standing with us, uh, sitting with us so long that you uh, helped with comments and questions. I thank my four guests who got the nerves to sit down at the stage with me and thank you very much.